All right, good evening, everybody. Um, we're gonna go ahead and start the uh, program this evening. Uh, welcome to our George Mason Center for Real Estate Entrepreneurship webinar on navigating the entitlement process, the Waycroft case study. Skilled real estate developers navigate a complex entitlement process to build successful projects. Uh, experienced developers know how to work with local governments, surrounding communities, and other stakeholders to creatively shape and improve their projects. Uh, this evening, we're gonna learn about the entitlement process from a case study presentation with Saul Centers, a major developer in the Washington DC area. Uh, Saul purchased a 2.8 acre site in 2014, which contained an auto dealership, fronting a major road intersection and adjacent to residential housing in the Roslyn Balsam Corridor in Arlington, Virginia. Over the next several years, the developer's vision of the property went through a rigorous entitlement process with inputs from county staff, neighbors, and community leaders. In 2020, a few months ago, the Waycroft opened, opened its doors, a striking 12-story mixed-use development with 491 apartment units and 60,000 square feet of retail, including an urban format Target store. Before we proceed, I'd like to thank the members of the center's advisory board. These are the leading companies and real estate organizations that support our mission of real estate education and allow us to produce educational events like the one we're having this evening. And now I'd like to introduce our speaker. Our speaker is Mary Beth Avedition, Senior Vice President for Saul Centers. She's the Senior Vice President for Acquisitions and Development, and over the course of her career, she has headed Acquisitions and Development for institutions such as the Washington Real Estate Investment Trust, Clark Construction, and now the Seoul Organization. So I, before I turn it over to Mary Beth, I uh, also want to uh, inform the audience that if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the question and answer feature at the bottom of your screen. So with that, I will turn the screen over to Mary Beth. Thank you. And let me just get our slideshow loaded. Looks like we're there. Okay, well, thank you, Eric, and good afternoon, everyone. I am the development manager for the Waycroft. Let me give you a heads up on what you're about to see. In my opinion, my opinion, the Waycroft is beautiful, it's a timeless building, and its architecture largely sold itself to the community, to the county planning staff and planning board, as well as the county board. However, if you think that simplified my job of obtaining the entitlements to build it, then you're in for a surprise. Our team had an extremely challenging road to navigate before getting our site plan approved. Basically, just like every project that goes through entitlements, there's always some kind of hot issue that complicates every deal. Those of you um, who are listening that are veterans to this process know what I'm talking about. There's no such thing as an easy project. And sometimes the most unlikely issues are the biggest stumbling blocks to overcome. This case study I'm about to share with you is no different. So. Sit back while I take you on the entitlement journey we experienced for the Waycroft. But before I start, there's just some housekeeping I'd like to discuss. As I go through this presentation, I'd like you to hold your comments and questions until the end. Of course, Eric said you can type them into the chat screen and that's fine, but I'm not gonna answer them until the end. Um, what I'd like you to do would be incredibly helpful is if you could take note of the slide number that you might want me to return to in order to address your question. The numbers are in the lower right-hand corner of each slide. There are almost 50 slides in this presentation that I have to run through. So taking note of the slide number will greatly speed up the Q&A phase. So thank you for that. Okay, now let me start uh, with this one truism. Value creation for any new development begins with its entitlement approval which for the Waycroft arrived after an 18 month intensive long public process that resulted in many design modifications. 
By the time the project reached the county board, it had successfully accommodated and balanced a variety of sometimes conflicting interests. The presentation you're about to see was given to the Arlington County Board in June of 2016. At that meeting, the board not only approved the rezoning of the land on which the project was to be built, but also approved a rather elaborate site plan and building design, which I'm about to show you. So bear with me while I give you some background on the project and its overall layout and architecture before getting into some of the challenges um, that were necessary to solve before our approvals would be granted. Over the course of a year, we assembled this 2.8 acre site from four landowners. Um, it, this lies at the edge of a, of a still growing edge city, Boston, uh, a much le less densely developed residential neighborhood uh, is on one side of the project and you can see the Boston CBD is on the other side of the project. It's a highly desirable location uh, at the corner of two of the busiest streets in Arlington, Glebe Road and Wilson Boulevard. And it's a 10 minute walk to the orange and silver metro lines that run through the Boston station. What started as largely a vacant car lot, uh, which you can see in this picture, it housed a few one and two story commercial buildings and a surface parking uh, for a car dealership. It transformed over the following five years into a mixed use project containing 491 rental apartments atop 60,000 square feet of retail and three levels of underground parking. Because the site is a buffer between the predominantly large scale commercial development to the north and east and the low scale residential development to the south and west, the design team stepped outside the box to recommend a building that responded to its context. They argued for rezoning the site to permit increased heights along one of the frontages in exchange for holding down heights near the lower rise neighborhood. Now this move did not gain any additional density, but it did result in a superior massing and more interesting height variety than the site's pre-existing zoning would have allowed. And it created an appropriate transition to the neighborhood. Our taller massing ranging from nine to 12 stories is located along Wilson and Glebe so that the lower building heights are achieved along 7th and Taswell streets. On the west and south sides of the block, the building significantly reduces in height. Turning down Vermont and Taswell, the building steps down several times until it reaches the five story height that runs along Taswell and turns the corner of 7th Street, then steps back up to nine stories as we approach Glebe Road. The project was designed to be developed as a single building, given the need for internal connections for servicing and accessing resident amenities. However, on the outside, it is experienced architecturally as a series of buildings, each with distinctive architectural expressions and materials that relate to the changes in the massing and the adjacent context. We referred to this building as building one, or this portion of the project as building one. It overlooks the corner of Wilson and Glebe. It design, its design derives from um, Art Deco style, uh, responding to the broad curve of the site. Composed of a series of vertical bays and curved balconies, the highly articulated center bay with stepped crown marks the entrance and creates an icon iconic expression at this very important intersection. The most significant uh, change in the architecture during the entitlement process as a, was a result of a review of this facade along Glebe Road. We responded, this was the original design. We responded to requests for breaking up the block face by eliminating an earlier design component that we called building four on the end. And then we shifted building three south in order to create a 15 foot setback. And that setback subsequently increased to a 30 foot setback. 
between buildings one and three. The resulting two building arrangement prompted the need to restudy building three. The re revised design for building three, which has its own residential lobby entrance, adapts a classic symmetrical apartment house massing. The deep red brick with contrasting precast trim details and overhanging cornice distinguishes it from building one and creates a strong residential identity at the corner of 7th and Glebe. Looking along 7th Street, our initial proposal, which had building four in it, is shown on the left. It extended that taller corner building much further down 7th Street. In the final design on the right, the taller building three extends only half as far, moving the height change 75 feet closer to Glebe Road. Looking east along 7th Street, the step down from building three seen in the distance marks the transition to the five-story height of building two, which is located across the street from three and four-story townhouses along 7th Street. These are existing townhomes here. The two circles highlight the entrance to the parking garage and the loading dock. Remember these two entrances. They became the biggest hot button of our entitlement process. I'll tell you more about that later. But as we continue around the block, the five-story height of building two continues up the east side of Taswell Street, creating a lower scale that is compatible with the townhomes on the opposite side of the street. Rather than have this long stretch be one continuous facade, we broke this up as well. Two 15 foot setbacks break up this elevation into three smaller elevations, each with distinguishing brick colors and trim details that are reminiscent of traditional brownstone walk-ups. Previously, as shown in the upper plan detail, the anchor retail tenant space was originally intended to extend the full depth of the site from Glebe to 7th, excuse me, from Glebe to Taswell. Though the brownstone Taswell Street frontage was to look residential, we had in mind that it would conceal a large store and limit foot traffic along that street because we presumed that the residents wanted their quiet street to remain quiet. Surprisingly, these neighbors wanted just the opposite. So in response to their feedback in the lower plan, you can see where we added seven street level residential units, which we call masonettes along Taswell Street, each with access to the perimeter sidewalk. Continuing to the building's Northwest corner, building two transitions several times up to building one wing, stepping up uh, to the 10 stories shown at this corner. This facade's details share many similarities with building one, uh, but there are some differences in detail and brick color. We fondly refer to this view as the flat iron corner, and we like the way it acts as a gateway to the Boston CBD. This view shows the one area of the project, the main residential entrance of building one, where we provided accent, accent lighting at the top and bottom center entry bay. The landscape plan shows that an extensive amount of landscape treatment has been added to a site that, if you recall, prior to this project was predominantly asphalt parking lots. In addition, the pre-existing narrow sidewalks were made four and a half to eight feet wider with our project to accommodate wider pedestrian pathways, large planting areas for street trees and ground plantings, as well as sidewalk cafe space along Wilson and Glebe. The building architect collaborated with the landscape architect to design two extensively planted courtyards on the second floor above the retail level. At the upper right corner uh, of the plan, you see another of our resident amenities, a rooftop pool deck. Uh, with grilling areas and soft seating groups, as well as expansive views from the top of building three. In addition, though not shown on these slides, the building has several other amenity spaces for residents, including a library slash lounge, a work from home space, a fitness center, 
and a club and gaming room. We also have an indoor play and grooming area for our doggy residents. On the lower left corner of the plan, there's a small outcropping of land where Wilson, North Vermont and North Tazewell come together. The land is actually owned by Arlington County and with their permission, we added landscaping, public art and decorative outdoor seating to improve the appearance of this little area so that the entire block looks cohesive as you walk around it. This is a plan of the first floor. The dark, the, excuse me, the pale salmon colored area in the middle of the plan is Target, uh, our anchor retail tenant of approximately 41,000 square feet. The darker salmon colored area space areas along Wilson and Glebe are uh, approximately 41, excuse me, approximately 20,000 square feet of smaller retail shop space. In bright orange, we show the residential common areas, including the apartment building's main entrance at the lobby, main lobby at the corner of Glebe and Wilson, a connecting corridor that goes to a secondary lobby on uh, North Taswell Street, and then another lobby, as I mentioned earlier, for the red brick building off of Glebe Road. The masonettes that I described earlier, located along Taswell, run along the bottom of the plan and are shaded in purple. As I mentioned earlier, in response to a request from planning staff and our neighbors, we added these two level walk-up units to create a more authentic residential experience along the street. The dashed red line represents a clear pedestrian pathway through the Target store, which we were required to provide in the Target lease in order to shorten the walk between Glebe and Taswell for people who are accustomed to cutting through uh, this large block. The parking is accessed from two different ramp locations shown in green, one off of Glebe Road, which was a late addition to our project, I'll discuss that later, and then the other is off of 7th Street. This was originally our one and only parking garage entrance for the entire project. The loading docks are shown in yellow, have been placed in two locations in response to the long length of the site. A two bay loading dock at the north end of the site, Taswell on the left, serves the retail fronting on Wilson and the two residential elevator cores. And then a six bay loading dock on 7th Street over here on the right serves the anchor retailer, the smaller retail shops along Glebe and the third residential elevator core. Both loading docks, as required by the county, have air-conditioned dumpster enclosures to contain odors from wet trash. Most developers going through the entitlement process these days are finding that increased traffic generation created by a new project tends to be a major issue raised by the community. Well, the Waycroft also fell into that category. This slide summarizes the net effect of automobile traffic created by our project, um, partly due to the residential use, but largely due to the retail use. The bottom line is the total site trips were projected to be 3,553 on a weekday and 5,517 on a Saturday. Initially, all of this traffic would enter our single garage entrance that was proposed to be located off of 7th Street. But in our discussions with the community, we were asked to add, investigate adding a ramp on Glebe Road to reduce the number of car trips along 7th Street. This was challenging because Glebe is a state-owned road, so we needed approval from VDOT to add this curb cut, an approval that VDOT was reluctant to give us. It took some intervention by certain high placed Arlington County politicians before VDOT actually granted us this access point. And as a result, we were able to add a right in, right out ramp off of Glebe Road, which will result in a, which has resulted in a 40% reduction in the number of cars using that 7th Street parking garage entrance. There are over 700 underground parking spaces in the Waycroft. The residential parking ratio is almost one space per apartment unit. And we have roughly one retail space for every 250 square feet of retail use. 
Parking level one is exclusively for retail parking. P2 has some retail, but it's mostly residential. And then P3 is exclusively for residential parking. These two plans of the typical upper level residential floor show how the project is subdivided into three connected buildings, each served by a different elevator core. We provided a mix of efficiencies, one bedroom, one bedroom den, two bedroom and three bedroom units. Before I get into this slide, I just wanna stop and have a little discussion about the first lesson in understanding the entitlement process. That first lesson is to fully grasp the concept that people inherently dislike change. And it's amplified when the change is slated to occur right across the street from where they live. So therein lies the story and the challenge surrounding the design of this project's parking garage and loading docks. Community rumors were rampant that a high traffic generating grocer like Whole Foods would lease the anchor retail space. You see, we were negotiating with several anchor tenant prospects while we were going through our approvals. So we couldn't pin down exactly what kind of tenant we would land or what sort of traffic they would generate. So naturally, the community assumed the worst case. Uh, that's, that's the normal course of things. Consequently, the access points for the loading dock and the parking garage were highly scrutinized and became one of the key issues during the entitlement process. There was a tremendous amount of discussion during the community meetings surrounding the service and loading of the site with respect to the 7th Street access point, particularly as it's situated relative to the existing alley that was on our site when we bought it. The primary loading dock serving the anchor retail tenant and the main garage doors, entrance doors, logically needed to be placed on 7th Street. We were told at the time that curb cuts for the loading dock and the garage were forbidden on the two major arterials, Glebe and Wilson, notwithstanding that we later got the Glebe Road parking garage entrance. At the time of the design, we were told no way. Of the two neighborhood side streets, Tazewell was a poor choice, it being one way in, in one direction from this direction going towards Wilson. Um, and it was lined with a whole lot more townhomes than 7th Street, which uh, actually only had five townhomes on 7th Street. Um, but the concerns voiced by those five townhouse owners received 100% backing from a very powerful civic association, the Bluemont Civic Association, which I'll describe later, um, sort of the, the issues that and the support that they provided to them and the concerns that we had to address. Um, but those concerns that we had to address added probably one to two months to the entitlement process. So now let me get back to this slide and start by explaining some of the existing conditions. Shown in red on this slide is the existing alley that used to service multiple property owners who backed up to this alley. It was encumbered by an easement with Arlington County and we ultimately had to submit an application to vacate it in order to build the Waycroft. The red dash segment of the alley shown in this slide is the portion that was vacated many years prior to accommodate the car dealership development. This is the building that housed the car dealership. So that had to be uh, vacated then in order to accommodate that building. Um, and when we purchased it, uh, that was the existing condition. Now, when this segment of the alley was vacated, you can't leave an alley dead end in the middle of a block. So the county added this blue segment to connect the alley down to North Taswell Street. We also had to vacate that easement before we could build the Waycroft. There was actually a very strong neighborhood contingent that was pushing us to use the alley to internalize all of our garage, parking garage and loading dock access. However, if we followed the path of the existing alley in designing our loading dock, it would have dumped cars and trucks onto North Taswell Street. As I mentioned, it was a sleepy little one-way street lined with townhouses that route would have been very disruptive to a large number of townhouse owners. <clears throat> there, was 
there were several community activists who spoke out saying that we didn't show them any options for our loading dock, but I had no choice but to politely and publicly denounce such statements. The slide shows a fraction of the options that we studied for the 7th Street loading dock design. I counted at least 25 different design options in my files that we tried to make work. But let's just focus on the three primary options that were on our site plan application at various points in time. These three plan details show how the dock design evolved over the 18 month long entitlement process. On the far left, you see where we started, a traditional back end loading dock that uses the street for all backing movements. Well, this design was a non-starter. You can see that the clearances were not there to allow trucks to back in when cars were parked in front of the five townhouses. Plus, the townhouse owners understandably objected vehemently to all that truck traffic right outside their front doors. Who can blame them? So, but we didn't control this part of the project yet. We were still in the assemblage process. Once we did control that part, we redesigned the, uh, so we redesigned the building so that we could fully enclose the loading dock, have all of the maneuvers, that middle image demonstrates that the trucks can pull head in, the doors close behind it, and all the backing occurs behind closed doors. Problem solved, right? Now, the problem with this option was that the loading dock location of the loading dock doors was right across from the five townhouse owners. So we ultimately did hit on a winning solution here, um, which shows the four bay loading dock along 7th Street, which was carved out of 19,000 square feet of space that was previously earmarked for retail. It required a five and a half foot thick transfer slab over the loading dock to create a large enough column free space for trucks to pull in and execute all backing movements inside after the doors had closed behind them. This muffled the backup beeping that would annoy the neighbors in the wee hours of the morning when grocers typically take deliveries. The loading dock door is more closely situated across from the existing alley in the adjacent block, which you can see here. And the garage ramp, garage ramp was moved a little bit closer to Glebe Road too. As a result of this change, we were able to fit in another uh, residential unit at the corner of 7th and Taswell. This slide shows the evolution of the 7th Street curb cuts serving the parking garage ramp and the loading dock. We heard county staff and community concerns that wide curb cuts of our initial design shown on the left were hazardous to pedestrians. In that image, you can see our biggest curb cut was 53 feet wide. Um, with each successive iteration, the curb cuts became progressively shorter. Um, the final approved design shown on the right reduces the widest curb cut to 32 feet wide. It breaks the garage entrance into two smaller 14 foot wide curb cuts and it creates two areas of pedestrian refuge that are four feet and 12 feet wide. But that wasn't everything. To address the neighborhood concerns about trucks idling in the street, if all the loading bays were occupied and they didn't want that noise outside their windows of trucks idling, we made this, this loading dock large enough to accommodate a 55 foot long tractor trailer truck inside the space shown in green on the right on the left or two 40 foot long box trucks shown on the right. The design of the loading dock door pictured in the upper left elevation had to balance the demands of aesthetics, sound attenuation and speed. The loading dock door needed to close at a higher rate of speed than a typical dock door in order to contain the truck maneuvering noises. The door includes some glass as requested by the community, but it needed to be mostly a solid door to achieve better soundproofing. We also studied the potential impacts of headlights glaring into the windows of the townhouses across the street. This shows the position of headlights as cars come up the ramp. 
we revised the ramp to be S-shaped. Previously, it was C-shaped. Uh, but with an S-shape, the lights from the vehicles are mostly directed into the inside walls of the ramp or out towards the loading dock of the adjacent apartment building. Not until the cars reach the top of the ramp and are level with the street that the headlights shine straight at the opposite townhomes. So based on this study, we recommended and ultimately received approval to remove five parking spaces on the street on the south side of 7th Street and in their place we created a green buffer using dense evergreen shrubs to mitigate the light pollution and the views of our parking ramp and service area. This slide shows a plan view as well as a rendering of that green buffer. To further address the concerns of the five townhouse owners on the south side of 7th Street, we replaced all of their windows and patio doors facing 7th Street with sound attenuating glass and frames. Remember the Bluemont Civic Association? They are a tenacious group and they did a wonderful job on behalf of their constituents. Um, they didn't believe that we could, couldn't move our loading dock and parking garage entrance even closer to Glebe Road and away from the five townhomes across the street. So they hired their own traffic consultant to prove us wrong. Their traffic engineer produced these two options that supposedly worked to the benefit of the community. We were rather surprised when these were presented by the community at our Transportation Commission hearing, as we were certain we'd tried every option to solve the issue. Naturally, rather than approve our plan at that hearing, the Transportation Commission asked us to study these options. And when we did, we found that there was a fatal flaw in the scale used in their analysis. We overlaid the Bluemont concept, which is shown in blue here, on our plan, which is shown in red. We discovered there was a significant difference between the scale of the building and the scale of the trucks. If we scaled the Blue Mont's truck diagram to match a 55 foot long tractor trailer truck, then our site would need to be nearly 60 feet wider in order to accommodate the truck maneuver they proposed. As this overlay shows, the back of the truck would extend through the Taswell Street facade. That's not going to work. Um, we ultimately proved that the design in our proposal was the most viable option and the community agreed with us once they understood the oversight made by their traffic engineer. I'd like to touch on some other benefits and requirements that our project brought to the neighborhood, including a new traffic light at Glebe and 7th Street and a reconfigured left turn lane uh, along northbound Glebe that lengthened the stacking lane for vehicles waiting to turn left onto 7th Street. Remember, they were expecting a lot of cars to come in here to this grocery store. We added uh, new crosswalks shown in yellow on this slide at Glebe, uh, 7th Street, at Taswell, and at Vermont. We widened 7th Street here, which was previously two lanes, to allow for three 11 foot wide lanes at the Glebe Road end of the street. One, one lane that would come in and two lanes that would go out, a left and a right and a straight. Um, we added a curb extension at Vermont and Wilson Boulevard intersection here. Um, that, was, that was created to shorten the distance that pedestrians would need to spend in the street when they were crossing. Along Taswell, we added multi-space parking meters to accommodate roughly 16 vehicles, where previously there was no metered parking. Along Wilson, by reconfiguring the taper for the right turn from Wilson onto Glebe, we fit in another two spaces. And finally, we added five off-peak spaces uh, on Glebe Road between our parking garage entrance and 7th Street. Upstream of our parking garage ramp, we had to forego on-street parking on Glebe in order to maintain safe sight lines for drivers exiting our garage. 
Here's a list of some of the other attributes of this project. The WACOF was awarded its LEED Gold certification in July of this year. Some of the more environmentally impactful efforts undertaken to earn LEED Gold included um, installation of a condensate water collection system to supply 100% of the um, irrigation water for landscaping. We have a highly efficient HVAC system utilizing VRF, which stands for variable frequency, excuse me, variable refrigerant flow. And for all of the apartments and common areas, that's the system that uh, is heating and cooling those spaces. Um, we have 11 electric vehicle charging stations in the garage, water efficient plumbing and LED lighting throughout the project without compromising either aesthetics or functionality. Over 75% of the construction debris was diverted to recycling in lieu of a landfill. And finally, 20% of the construction material value came from recycled content and regional materials. In addition, there were several other non-lead attributes of the project that either helped to minimize the carbons, carbon, footprint, carbon footprint of the project or serve other community goals, including we committed to achieve an ENERGY STAR score of 75 within four years of project completion. We paid for an on-site capital bike share station. We provided ample on-site secure bicycle storage for residents and retail employees. We provided bike to work shower and locker facilities for retail employees and building staff. We committed to implement a county approved loading dock management plan, a first of its kind requirement in Arlington to minimize dock use disruption to the neighboring homeowners. We also spearheaded a zoning text amendment to permit on-site rental car use, thereby allowing us to enter into a lease with enterprise and, support, and supporting a community goal to reduce car ownership in the county. We committed to supporting Arlington's car-free diet by offering new residents, retail employees, and building staff either a $65 Metro Fare card or a one-year bike share membership or a one-year car share membership. We made a 30-year commitment to provide 22 on-site affordable dwelling units. And we commissioned and installed on-site public art, a 10 and a half foot tall bronze sculpture by the artist Lisa Shear to enhance the streetscape. Though the approval process seemed like a long slog, it was truly a demonstration of what it takes to achieve a success that outlives the temporary triumph of erecting a building. It took a willing developer, a very creative design team, and a very collaborative public process to successfully complete this project. While that concludes my formal presentation, I don't wanna stop yet. I first wanna show you some real pictures of what it looks like. You've been seeing the renderings because that's what we showed to the county board, but the project is built. It's already 65% leased on the residential side and 80% leased on the retail side. Um, and this is what it looks like in real life. And you can compare it against the renderings. This is our building one at the corner of Glebe and Wilson and building three at the corner of Glebe and 7th. This building looks better than the rendering if you ask me. This is building two, the frontage along Taswell and the flat iron corner of the building at Vermont and Wilson. I'll take you indoors now and show you a few shots of what it looks like inside. At the broad curve of the building, our main entrance, our main lobby, this is a, the main lobby. Uh, you can see the Art Deco uh, influence is carried inside the building as well. Uh, this is one of our resident amenity areas, the, the library lounge that I mentioned earlier, beautiful warm space lush landscaping in this courtyard. This also has a fire pit, a gas fired fire pit at one end. This is a beautiful babbling fountain along here. There's a fire pit, excuse me, a fireplace, a gas fireplace um, at the other end of this pergola and seating area. And the planting here is incredibly lush and irrigated and beautiful. On the roof, we have our pool, 
the ramp leading up to the pool is flanked by seating areas on either side as well, grilling areas on one side and eating areas and then soft seating on the other. Um, something I didn't mention, and that is while we do have the three building types that I've described and the looks on the outside, our architect recommended that rather than deliver 491 identically finished apartment units, they thought, why don't you create an identity for the apartments themselves inside each building? So building one is shown here. All of the apartments in building one have these finishes. All of the apartments in building two are more contemporary. We're trying to appeal to a lot of different tastes and, and um, age groups. And so we felt being completely traditional or completely contemporary was a little bit short-sighted. And since we have 491 units and all these uh, ways to slice and dice the building, let's do it. So again, this is building two. And then finally, these are the finishes in building three. And now I truly am finished with my presentation. So if there are questions, Eric, I'm gonna let you manage that process of handing okay. the questions over. All right, thank you. Um, uh, again, please put your questions in the Q and A. Uh, I'll I'll go through as many of them as we can. Uh, we do have a couple of more a couple of minutes left for questions. So, first question: um, uh, How did you and the county settle on a Euclidean zoning designation that did not align with the new GLUP category that was approved? We did have a, a sort of shorthand GLUP, uh, general land use plan is what they're referring to. The GLUP um, plan did require uh, a little bit of input from the Long Range Planning Commission. We had one meeting with them and it was approved. It was close enough to the zone that was going to have otherwise applied to that site. Um, so we were allowed to go forward as a result of that ruling by the Long Range Planning Commission. Can can you share the budget for the for the project? Um, it's public Amer it's public information because we're a publicly traded company. It was two hundred and seventy five million dollars. But I think we're bringing it in under budget, actually, if you can believe <laughs> that. Uh, what was the AMI requirement for the twenty two uh, ADUs? Sixty percent. Sixty percent. Sixty percent of. Uh, adjusted median income AMI is what is being referred to, meaning people who, um, for those of you who aren't familiar with the term, people who are uh, at that 60% level uh, can qualify for uh, an apartment of the 22 apartments that we have that are affordable. Um, the next question is similar to, to that one. Next question refers to flux slide five and six. What made you choose mainly a brick facade? Did you ever consider any other materials? No, and I'll tell you why. Um, I don't know what other materials you were referring to, but there are uh, uh, a, a lot of panelized um, facades that I see on newer buildings these days. Um, I think they're probably less expensive to install. I'm not sure where they, how they cost uh, on a material basis, but this is, this is the saw way, if you will. Our company is a little bit different from uh, typical spec developers. And the, and the reason we're different is we don't like to sell anything. We wanna be uh, a legacy developer. We refer to ourselves as a legacy developer. We own, uh, we buy, we, we build, we develop to own these projects forever. And if you're gonna be a forever owner, you don't wanna build cheap. You wanna build something. Our first cost is always higher than a spec developers would be, or somebody who's gonna build it, lease it up to just a certain point where they can then flip it out to a pension fund or whatever. We're not planning to do that. We're keeping it in our portfolio. And this actually um, is a sales point that I've made many, many times during my, um, conversations with community members and planning folks, um, county board members and whatnot, we're gonna be your neighbor forever. So those five townhouse owners that I mentioned earlier, they know me, they call me, they email me when they have an issue or a comment or a question or a concern. And, um, 
and they know they can. And I'm happy to take their calls and do what I can to help solve their their concerns. Uh, and that's you know I guess I'm getting a little bit off course from the and from the uh, discussion, but uh, it's a little bit of a plug for um, those few of you out there who do plan to own and develop and hold in your portfolio for a while. It is a huge selling point that we're able to say that. So next question, um, regarding the new windows on your uh, neighbors, uh, your, your five thousand home neighbors, did you install the new windows for the neighbors or did you cut them a check and they did their own work? If you did it yourself, uh, how did you manage waterproofing liability? We hired a firm, um, I'm trying to remember how this all worked. We paid the bill, we hired one firm to do them all so they were all consistent and um, they entered into contracts directly with the firm. Uh, so the individual, they were, we gave them the option to first interview the firm. We didn't wanna force feed anything down there. We met with them. We showed them the different types of windows that they might choose. They were actually, we originally thought that triple pane windows were better. It turns out they weren't. Double pane windows where you have two dissimilar thicknesses of glass is more sound attenuating than triple pane windows. So we had to have a meeting with them and explain that to them and let them hear from, them from the installer because they're the ones who are going to hold the guarantee. Um, they, that is how we structured it. We had them enter into the contract, but we paid the bill. Next question, how did you arrive at the uh, 22 affordable units? It's a um, percentage. Well, first of all, there's two components of how Arlington County does their affordable housing requirement. Um, there is a portion that you would contribute if for your base density. And there is an option to either put those units on site or find another location where you can put them in the county or you can buy out, you can write a big check to buy out of your base density requirements. And that's what we opted to do. The 22 units came as a result of bonus density. We sought bonus density for this project. And the, I don't recall all of the, the numbers. I had this at one time, but it's been many years, four years since I went through this process. But there is a certain percentage of the bonus density that has to then be provided as on-site affordable housing. I think it was 25% of the bonus density had to be on-site affordable. And so that 25% and you have an average unit size, it just turned out to be 22 units. Okay. And a certain mix, you have to have a certain number of two bedrooms and three bedrooms and one bedrooms and whatnot. Um, how early in the process did you start community outreach with the neighboring communities? And I guess well, related, I have a related question too, is can you also talk a little bit more about the, the 18 month timeline as to how, how that was broken up? in the process? Oh, um, well, how early? You can see we started the discussion before we had completed the assemblage. Um, we weren't sure we were gonna get that corner. And there's an interesting story there. That corner was occupied by an enterprise car dealership, car, rental car agency on a long-term lease, a very long-term lease. If you recall, I went through a zoning text amendment in order to have enterprise have a use, be a user on this property. Well, they, I had to do that because the only way we could acquire that site was to strike a deal with the property owner and then strike a deal with their tenant, enterprise. Um, so the enterprise component was, look, we'll move you to a temporary location while we develop the site. And after it's developed, we'll move you back. And you can have a storefront, which they have right off of Glee Road, and some of the parking spaces in the garage. Uh, in fact, on that P2 level, if you saw there was a little piece of P2 that was set aside for retail, well, that's actually their parking area that they used to have up on the surface. Um, so that, um, that required a zoning testament because rental car use was not allowed in this particular zone. Um, and many other zones as well, but county staff saw the sense of, uh, of allowing rental car use because the more you have, car sharing is somewhat going out of style. It's more Ubers and, you know, other sorts of, you know, you can get an Uber as quick as trying to sign up for a zip car. So zip cars and whatnot are kind of falling out of favor. 
Um, but people still need to rent cars and it's just, if they're gonna take a long trip. And you know, the county saw the sense of having that use in this zone as well as any other zone of its, of its type in the county. And I'm, I know that this wasn't the only zone that was impacted by that zoning text amendment, but it was because of that deal that we pushed this through and encouraged, I shouldn't say push this through, encouraged staff to uh, see this through, which they did. Um, as for the timing, breaking up the 18 months, my goodness, um, you know, a lot of this was working with redesigning the garage, redesign the parking, the loading dock. I showed you the slide that had six or six or nine or whatever examples, but I actually had 25 in my files. We went back to the well and tried things over, and a lot of which we didn't even show to the community. We just kept, we knew enough from our outreach with the community um, through our site plan review committee meetings, site plan SPRC is the shorthand version of it, through the dialogues that we had with them. And these meetings would go on for several hours um, and they usually happen about, I'd say on average once a month for about five or six months at least. I know Nancy Iacomini is on the call. I saw her name pop up. She was the chair of our SPRC meeting. She might have a better recollection of how many and how long they went, but that's a big piece of it is going through that process because it's all about addressing the community's concerns. <clears throat> and she did a, Nancy did a masterful job of orchestrating uh, and keeping things on track so that we could discuss these issues and then send us back with our marching orders of things to study um, in, in advance of the next meeting that we would have. Okay. Question is, uh, how do you select the public art? Mm. Lisa Shear has worked with us in the past. Um, we love the work that she does. She's a delightful person to work with. She's, um, she did the work that we put in front of Clarendon Center, in front of the Circa restaurant. Um, so that was my first experience working with her. And we have subsequently hired her on for whew, two, three, four different other projects that where she has done work. And in fact, I have another project in Bethesda that I've been working on now, we're, we're, we're using her yet again. She's very um, talented. Um, I first found her through an art consultant that was recommended to me by the um, art folks that work for the Arlington County um, Public Arts Committee. Um, they recommended uh, a consultant who then sort of trotted out three or four different artists for us to evaluate. And we just have always liked the work that she does and the professionalism with which she conducts herself. The Arlington combination of zoning and site approvals is a bit unique in the region. Can you discuss the benefits or concerns with that approach? Could you rephrase? I'm not quite sure I understand the question. Yeah, uh, it's a little... So I'm re I'm, I'll just read it verbatim. The Arlington combination of zoning and site approvals is a bit unique in the region. Can you discuss the benefits or concerns with this approach? I don't find it terribly yeah. unique. You know, I find that, you know, in order for uh, any jurisdiction to grant a change in, uh, in a zoning ordinance, they want to know what you're going to put on that, on that property once they rezone it. Uh, it just sort of stands to reason that, you know, if you want this, then show me what you're going to give us for it. Um, and that's not unusual. I mean, I've seen this happen in other jurisdictions as well. My most um, storied experience is with Arlington, but it certainly is an exclusive. And, um, you know, theirs is probably more um, elaborate and precise. And I think that comes from probably many years of, of oopses, you know, like, oops, we should have asked for this. And oops, that that was an unintended consequence. We don't want that to happen. So they plug those holes with uh, site plan conditions that then let, you know, don't allow that accident to happen again, uh, unfortunate circumstance to happen again. So I think, um, I think it's, it's definitely a little bit more complicated in Arlington than other jurisdictions, but it certainly isn't unusual. I have not worked outside this region, so I can't speak for other cities that have um, 
I'm sure, you know, you know, historical considerations and, you know, San Francisco jumps to mind is probably being rather difficult, but I, I, I can't speak with firsthand experience, but I don't think it's that unusual. Right. I agree. How critical was having Target as an anchor in the community outreach and the project financing? I will tell you, I wish I had known it was going to be Target during the community outreach. If it had, I would not have had these probably one to two extra months of trying to satisfy our adjacent property owners because traffic was the problem. And Whole Foods is renowned for generating huge traffic problems. They have a store in Clarendon, which is, you know, a couple of metro stops up the way from where we are in Ballston and their store was constantly creating traffic jams on major arterials around it. And, you know, these people shop there that were our neighbors, they know, they see, they read the papers, they, you know, they read the blogs. They know that's a problem. They don't want that right across the street from them. Target on the other hand is not the traffic generator. They have a different, different type of customer. Their grocery component is a piece of their footprint, but not their entire footprint. If you've been in one of their stores, they're, they have a little bit of everything. So you could probably do a lot of your um, shopping in, in there, but you're, it's not a Whole Foods, which has a cult following. Um, it's doing well, the store is. I wish we had, as I said, if I had known that we had Target or had them on a, under lease, uh, which we didn't during the entitlement phase, then my entitlements would have gone a little more smoothly. Um, but uh, it certainly did help with the financing. We did know it by then, um, did we? I'm sorry, I'm, I'd have to back up. I, that's not true. Um, they had to, our financing was in place before we had Target. Um, our financing was a construction to permanent loan type of financing. It wasn't, um, it wasn't the type of, you know, per construction financing by a bank and then permanent financing by a life company, which is an another way of capitalizing, you know, providing uh, the, the capital for these projects. Um, so I'm, I misspoke a minute ago because I, I love to sell uh, people on the fact that we do have a target here. It certainly has helped with the leasing of the rest of the retail space as well. I'm sure it's helped with the leasing of the residential units um, but no, I think the strength of the project, the location, and the um, credit worthiness of the borrower in our case was was really the sales pitch that our that that sold us to our lender. Thank you. Uh, next question is, what was the final FAR or floor area ratio? Four point five. Four point five. Mm -hmm. And another technical question. Uh, did you have to get tie back agreements for, for the townhouses across Tazewell, uh, Tazewell and 7th Street? No, we did not. We oh. were, we had public right away on four sides of us. So we didn't have to go under anybody's okay. um, houses. Okay. Was there contaminated soil on this site? I think we had a little, but it wasn't anything that is so memorable to me that, um, you know, going to say, oh, it was a brownfield. No, it wasn't anything. You know, there was a car dealership there. So there were things. There also was a dry cleaner on the site at one point. But whatever was there, it wasn't outside of our budget to deal with. Okay. And uh, was the community represented during the entitlement process by a broad number of persons or was it a small number of very vocal persons uh, oh, I staying would say in the immediate area? I would say broad. We had very well attended SPRC meetings. <clears throat> it was a big, is a big, um, you know, number of homes, big townhomes or you know, cluster communities. Um, they're very concerned about what's going to be built across the street from them. So a lot of these people showed up, and they were very unified in their message. Um, whether they lived right on the edge of the street across from where we were, or if they were deeper in and not so close, they were very unified in their um in their voice and um and well represented by some very very intelligent and articulate individuals who are who are good at this and and know what they're doing and know how to um plead the case of you know what's important to the constituents in the neighborhood we got the message really loud and clear it was 
you know, and it wasn't, uh, and, and they were all very professional. You know, there was this one little glitch, as I mentioned, with this um, outside traffic consultant who made a mistake. And it was a little bit of a stumbling block for us because we were sort of, well, in the middle of a transportation hearing, commission hearing, uh, surprised by it. But, um, you know, we got over it. And at the end of the day, I have to tell you, this is, um, this is kind of amazing. The five townhouse owners who were the most um, concerned about the whole process um, wrote a letter to me, an email to me. I, I was copied actually. They wrote the, the memo to the email to the all the county board members just a couple of months ago, a month or so ago, saying, Thank you, Saul. You delivered what you promised. You made it work for us. You know, we had all these various things we were concerned about. And you've addressed them. Uh, we're happy to be your neighbors. And oh my gosh, the, who whoever has that happen? That was just amazing to me to to have that sort of an email go to the county board members. And you know, one of the board um, one of the board members said, "Yep, Saul, you've raised the bar for all the rest of the developers <laughs> coming into Arlington." Which I'm like, "Oops." Well, you know, that's okay. You know that that's all right. We need to build good buildings. We need to build uh, collaboratively with our neighbors. All right. Um, <coughs> that's all. Well, unless there are uh, any other questions, we're coming up on the hour. Um, I mean, I agree with Mary Beth. I think the entitlement process, you know, for all its, a pro, you know, for all its effort and, and, and expense and, and time that it takes, I think eventually it, they do come out with a better project for, for everybody. And I think, you know, congratulations to Saul for a great project. Uh, the fact that you opened during a pandemic, leased up during a pandemic, uh, both your retail and your residential is just a testament to the quality of the project. Uh, which, in, which in turn is a result of this entitlement process that you guys navigated beautifully with, with the community. So with that, um, I'd like to thank Mary Beth for sharing her time tonight. Uh, before uh, people go, I would like to make some announcements. Um, so, we are now accepting applications for our spring 2021 class if, for our master's in real estate development program. If you're interested, go to realestate.gmu.edu. We have two upcoming webinars that you might be interested in on November 17th. It's uh, High Hurdles for Redeveloping Older Retail, which is the Scout on the Circle project in Fairfax City with combined properties. Uh, do join us for that one. And in December 15th, we have another webinar called Data Revolution, 5G Wireless and Impact on Real Estate. And if you want to get information on that, please shoot me an email. Uh, my email is down there on the screen. And again, we'd like to thank Mary Beth for spending uh, you know, an hour with us this evening on a great project. And thank you very much to everybody for joining us this evening. Thank you for your interest in uh, real estate educational activities at George Mason University. Uh, we hope to see you at an upcoming webinar. Thank you for attending.